we actually cheated casinos out of $25 million. It was actually the simplest move ever. How did you get started doing that? Kind of happened through my progression through degenerative gambling. Uh, throughout my childhood, I was gambling from eight years old, starting with flipping baseball cards uh, for keeps. Uh, to make the long story short, I, uh, when I was 18 years old, I, I bought a uh, brand new convertible Mustang, drove out to Vegas. I had $20,000 in it uh, in, the back, in the trunk. Uh, I gambled it and lost and found myself living in the street in Las Vegas. And uh, eventually uh, I realized I had to do something. Uh, in order to survive, so I, I um, became a dealer uh, in a casino and uh, just looking to get enough money to go home back, back to back to New York. And uh, I just could never get the money together because um, you know I was paying rent in a small apartment. And finally, one night in my casino, uh, a guy walked into the casino, and it uh, turned out he was a, a very well-known uh, international casino cheat. And we started to talk and he said to me, well, you know, let's meet after your shift. I met him. Uh, 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 we clicked, uh, you know, I have a good instinct of whether or not I can trust people. I trusted this guy and uh, he, he, uh, he's 20 years older than I am. And he uh, proposed that uh, him and I team up together and start cheating casinos. That's how it happened. So when you started, like, what were you doing? Like, how do you... How did you cheat casinos in the beginning? Uh, I was stealing a game called Baccarat, uh, and I figured out a way to actually set up the cards uh, in the card shoe that they would be dealt out uh, so that the players would win. And I figured out how to do that, and uh, that's the first cheat I ever did, the particular scam that I did. It's called a false shuffle scam, where, you, where you're shuffling the cards, but you're not really shuffling the cards. Now, was it just Baccarat? Uh, that particular scam was just Baccarat. But then after that scam was over, I joined up with Joe, and he had two other people on his team. So we became a four-person a four person cheating team, and we went all over the world for, well, 12 or 13 years together. And then after that, Joe retired, and then I took over the team for another 12 years. So I was actually cheating for 25 years professionally and, and uh, doing all kinds of uh, scams, but the, the scams were all based on um, manipulation of chips. We would make our bets after the, the, the decision was already known. It's called pass posting. So I'm basically considered uh, to have been the, the best professional casino cheat of all time. How much do you think that you got altogether? There's a difference between how much I got and how much I made. Uh, over 25 years, uh, you know, we actually cheated casinos out of, say, $25 million. Uh, in the winter, we'd be working the, you know, the Puerto Rico, the Bahamas, where all of it, uh, Aruba. Uh, these are places where there's going to be a lot of people and the casinos are going to be busy. In the summer, we would be in Monte Carlo or, or the south of France or South America. And then the rest of the time, we would be working in Las Vegas and Atlantic City and and uh, the rest of the American or Canadian casinos. So the expenses, uh, you know, out of that 25 million, we probably spent 40% of it just on traveling and eating and hotel expenses. When you look at kind of other people who are professional casino cheats, right? Is that kind of par for the course in that sense? Like, is that? Generally speaking, that statement is correct. Now there have been a few one shot scams all in Baccarat, because Baccarat is unique in that once the cards are dealt and put into the card shoe and they come out, the, the player decisions cannot affect the order of the cards. Uh, in Blackjack, that's different. The cards uh, are shuffled, but you can never know the exact order of the cards throughout a whole deck or a whole six or eight deck shoe because the, the, the player's decisions affect the order of the cards. So. Uh, people have come up with ways to film and record the order of the cards. Therefore, they would have knowledge of the whole eight deck shoe. So these scams have grossed, you know, nobody really knows for sure, but between 50 and $100 million uh, where in one particular sitting, 
uh, or one, one particular night in a casino, they've, they've gotten more than a million dollars in one night. I mean, the most I ever got in one night was maybe a hundred and twenty, a hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so we're talking, you know, much larger stuff. But the difference between me and them is they all get caught. Uh, yeah, um, I never got caught, so uh, I rather have a few million and uh, not have any problems than get the. Uh, you know, 40 or 50 million get caught and then have to give it back and maybe go to jail. How did you never get caught? The basic reason uh, is that I knew when to stop and I wasn't greedy. Uh, you know, I, I knew when I had a lot of heat. There was one point in time in Las Vegas when uh, I'm known for this particular move uh, called uh, Savannah, like Savannah, Georgia, but it was actually named after the uh, a stripper in a, in, a, in a titty bar who was actually giving us lap dances when we thought of the move. But um, we just um, knew because uh, uh, I was doing that particular Savannah move and there was a lot of heat on me because everybody in the uh, surveillance uh, business and all the, uh, the gaming commission in, in Las Vegas, uh, the gaming control board, uh, they, they all knew I was the one cheating, but they couldn't figure out what I was doing. You know, it's kind of like rubbing their nose in it. And I, the move was so good that I actually used surveillance filming me to, to inadvertent. They were uh, unknowingly help, helping me cheat. But it was the best move of all time because it, it never got caught. The casinos never figured it out until I revealed it in the book. And, and through that, through that, uh, Nick, I became a what I'm doing now. I became a consultant to casinos. I now work for casinos all over the world, uh, training them on how to protect themselves from people like me. To make it short, I would bet $10,000 on a roulette wheel in chips. If I won, I got paid. If I lost, I just took the bet back and, and they never saw it. So you never got caught, but this move, the Savannah, like, can you just kind of describe what is it? Like this it was a kiss move. Keep it simple, stupid which uh, casinos, they always think when you're taking uh, millions of dollars from them that you have something that's really sophisticated. It was actually the simplest move ever. You know, if you have a grandmother, a great-grandmother or a grandfather that's, you know, in his, in his or her 90s or 100s, I could teach them the whole move in uh, five seconds and take them into the casino and do it, as long as they're capable of just lifting two chips off the, off the uh, layout and, and putting two chips down like they're making a bet. That's all it requires. And uh, what it was is I would bet. Now, this chip here, this white chip, represents $5,000. This red chip is $5. And in, uh, in most casinos in Las Vegas, the, the $5,000 chips and the $5 chips are the same size. So I would make the bet on, on roulette. I would bet $5,000 and $5 on top. And the $5 chip on top would be jutted out slightly like this. So it's jutted out, pointing toward the dealer. Now, when the dealer looks at it, the dealer sees that there is a $5 chip on top and also sees that there's a chip on the bottom, but the dealer cannot see the color of the chip on the bottom. Therefore, the dealer assumes that what, what he or she is looking at is a bet of ten dollars. It's they psychologically are manipulated into thinking that it's a ten dollar bet, okay? Because and they never step out of the box to like you know to look down at the bet because it's all the way down at the bottom of the layout. So what's bet actually is the five thousand and five dollars just like that. So what happens? It's bet on an outside column bet which pays two to one. There's three columns uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the roulette layout where you bet each one pays two to one. They're at the bottom of the layout. If one of my columns wins, I just go, yes, I, I won the bet. Yes, there it is, 10,000 bucks, winner, yes. Now the dealer doesn't know what the hell I'm talking about it because the dealer thinks that it's a $10 bet like this, but it's really a $5,000 and $5 bet like this, right? So the dealer has uh, the dealer thinks like I'm some kind of nut. What's this guy getting all excited about? He won $10 or $20, two for one, right? 
but I have a $5,000 chip underneath there. And then finally, I have to say to the dealer, look, look at it. Because the dealer is saying, no, sir, you only have $10 there. So I said, look, come down and look at it. I'm pointing to it like this. Look at it. And then the dealer would come down and look at it and then, boom, see it. And, and they get bit in the nose because there's a $5,000 $5, chip sitting under there. It's a $10,000 payoff. I mean, that's a huge payoff, right? And, you know, and, and we only did this in, uh, you know, top rate casinos where they had that kind of a maximum where you could bet up to 5000 and get paid 10000 So the dealer would then tell the supervisor, look, the guy had a $5,000 chip under there. And the supervisor would say, like, why didn't you call it out? Because they have to alert the pit to these big bets like that uh, before they spin the ball. But obviously, the dealer is not calling out the bet because the, the dealer didn't see it. So then they get suspicious. And what do they do, Nick? When they get suspicious, they call surveillance. And surveillance can run it, run it back, right? And, uh, and they can run it right back. And in, within seconds, they can get... They can see what happened. Was it a legitimate bet or not? And they, they run it back. And sure enough, they see it's a legitimate bet. I made the bet well before the dealer spun the ball, and they have to pay it, $10,000. But what happens when I lose? Now, there's five there's $5,005 over there. On the top of the wheel is my partner. And my partner is concentrating on the where the uh, when and on what number the ball drops. And my partner, being right on top of the wheel, has an, actually a better angle on the wheel and can actually see it, see where that ball drops a fraction of a second before the dealer does. So if he yells, shit, or hey, or whatever, because people yell and scream in casinos all the time, that's my signal that I got to take that bet off the layout, right? Because I, you know, I don't, I'm not going to let them take it. If they take it, that's $5,000 that are gone, right? So... And um, and it's not like I had to go out and, and grab it and, you know, do some kind of, uh, you know, violent move to, to go get the chips back. All I had to do was sit very softly, just pick it up. Now, you would think the dealer would catch me every time, but the dealer only actually saw me pick the chips up one of every five times. I mean, we kept records, so we know it's about 20 percent of the time the dealer would actually catch me. So if the dealer didn't catch me and I just gently picked up the bet, right, and it disappeared in my pocket, right, it was all over with, you know, they, that's it, it's done. But when the dealer did catch me, right, it was like they didn't react kindly because it's a flagrant violation when you pull off a, a losing bet before they can take it. And they, they would start, hey, put that back. And then as soon as that happened, right, I would immediately, I had a glass, uh, uh, well, not a coffee cup, I would have a, uh, a cocktail glass in my hand, and I would immediately go into a, a drunk routine like this. What? What happened? What happened? And the dealer is yelling and screaming, you know, put that bet back. Oh, so what do I put back? Do I put back the $5,000 bet with a $5 chip on top? No. I put back $10. You know, usually... Uh, a supervisor or a pit boss would come running into the pit because the dealer screamed. You know, the, the, the pit boss wants to know why the dealer screamed. And the dealer explains, yeah, he tried to pick up his bet after it lost. And I'm like this, hey, Mr. Pit Boss, how's it going? What's up? Me and you, we're going to go out drinking after this. Come on, come drink it with me, right? And it's only about $10, so they don't ever call surveillance to see what happened. They don't care. It's just $10. But when it wins, when it wins, it's a legitimate bet. But you could only do that, though, once you won. You had, you'd leave the table. You'd have to go to another place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not only, not only that, but even if the bet lost, I would have, we would have to leave the casino or at least, at least come back on a different shift. Why? Because let's say, at, let's say some pit boss decided – uh, or somebody in surveillance decided that after they ran the the, uh, the, camp, the the video back and they saw it was a legitimate bet, right? What happens if they decide, well, let's see if this guy was in here before. How long has he been here, right? Because it's still a suspicious thing that nobody saw the bet get made. And then they figure it out. And I never gave them that chance. We were, we were smart enough to know that one bet, win or lose. I mean, don't forget, Vegas, you got 60, 70 casinos where you can do this. 
Are you ready for some harder slash listener submitted questions? Absolutely. So, easiest game to cheat at, hardest game to cheat at? Easiest game to cheat at, let, uh, because there's so many hands out there all the time. There's so many people betting. And most importantly, the, uh, the angle between the, the angle and distance between the dealer and the farthest player away in distance at the bottom of the wheel is greater than in any other casino. What about the hardest one? What's craps? Because you have, it's a big table, but you have three employees on it. You have a stick man and you have a, what's called a base dealer on each side that, 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 uh, uh, takes the uh, dice, excuse me, that, that, uh, pays the bets, takes the bets, and the stick man pushes the dice to the, to the dice shooter. And sometimes you even have a box man who sits across from the sit man and watches all the action. So, uh, and, and in order to, the, the actual physicality of the moves are harder on a craps table than on any of, the, any of the other games. Like what usually tips you off to a cheat? The acting weird and doing strange things would have apply to high tech cheating uh, because they've got gadgets and they've got to they they've, they've got to constantly test and touch their gadgets uh, especially uh, around games like uh, electronic roulette and slot machines um, you know that would that would be a giveaway on the regular standard te- uh, table games it would be very hard to detect before they do anything the cheating uh, unless they're acting really nervous or, or, or they're craning their heads to see other people's cards. Uh, but what I teach is there are some real subtleties about how casino uh, surveillance or even table games people can catch on to a, a professional cheating team is by the way they bet the chips. They have a, they bet their chips in a certain way so they, the dealer to ever have to touch the chips or have a second look at their chips. And the way they do that is by betting, by betting their chips always perfectly straight and one on top of the other, not slant it off like I was showing before with a move. Perfectly straight. Because, uh, Nick, nobody bets that way. People, when they're betting their chips, especially in games like roulette, when people are making multiple bets, they're betting on all the numbers, you know, they're moving around. And they don't pay attention to their bets. They just put the chips down and they don't care how they land. They don't care if they're in the center of the number or if they're not stacked up one on top of the other. But a professional casino cheating team, they're that all the series of bets that they make. And in roulette, a lot of bets are necessary in some of these uh, advanced scams that they, they make sure if they make six or seven or eight bets on the roulette layout, let's say six or seven numbers, their bets are always perfectly placed in the middle of the number, which is in the middle of the box, and perfectly stacked one chip on the other. So I always say, and the dealers are spending a lot of time on the game fixing up all the messy bets on the layout. So they never touch or look at the bets that are perfectly placed. So I warn them, which it kind of seems contradictory, but it's nevertheless true. If you see somebody betting correctly, perfectly correctly, a hundred percent of the time over a series of bets, call surveillance right away because you have a cheating team. How, how prevalent is cheating in a casino? Is this something that's happening every day in every casino? Or is this something that is happening occasionally? Like how prevalent does it happen every day in a casino in every casino that's, you know, got 30 or 40 or 50 tables or more. Yes. Uh, To the extent, of what it happens of, of, of what cheating occurs is it major cheating is it something that could take the cheating for thousands of dollars 90 percent, 95 percent of the time not it's somebody you know maybe trying to add a quick ten dollars or to their winning bet or somebody trying to pull a, a losing bet off uh for ten dollars um uh, much more common now than the actual cheating is what we call advantage play which means that intelligent people who gamble uh, and who have the patience to look at certain games that they could, there could actually be a, a mathematical advantage to them uh, instead of to the house. Like I'm sure you've heard of card counting. So now with all the gaming and the casinos going on, you know, more than ever, 
more, more, more anywhere now in the United States than anywhere else. Um, there's, there's, there's a big cheating scam going on somewhere, you know, every week for sure. Like a major scam going on every week, for sure. But when you compare, you know, when you analyze that, uh, taking into account of how many casinos there are, you know, it's, it's not that much. Do you think are more people doing it now than they have in the past? Yes. Uh, more cheating is going on now. Uh, uh, for a lot of reasons. One is uh, uh, when you talk about the advance, uh, the advances in technology, uh, the cheats and the hackers and all that, they they utilize it and adapt to new technology much fast, much faster than casinos still. So and, then, and now the um, the small time cheats know that casinos are more interested in the big time hacking and uh, technology stuff that they think, well, now we're just a little we're just little cheats in here looking to make you know, a couple hundred dollars a day. So they go in and uh, they, they feel they have a, a better uh, a better chance of avoiding getting caught because of the increase in overall cheat. It's the last one. Did cheats know other cheats? Like, did you know other people? Oh, like, oh absolutely. He's... Absolutely. The, uh, we were, uh, like I said before, we cheated every game, but we really like to work roulette the most. And we would travel the world. So if we're in Reno, Nevada, one weekend, and we're, we're playing roulette, and we notice a couple of guys in the Bahamas uh, a week later who were also on the wheel on the roulette table while we were in Reno, Nevada, you get very suspicious. And then if you see them two weeks later in London on a, on a roulette wheel, you know they're working. You know they're doing something. You know, they're not, they're not just traveling around gambling, right? So one one uh, one really great story is uh, I'll tell you very quickly is uh, we were in Lake Tahoe, Nevada, and we were on our uh, we were on the, the roulette table. So when I say on the wheel, I mean on the roulette table. So we were on the wheel getting ready to pass false a uh, hundred dollar chip straight up on a number underneath the dolly. You know uh, when the when you when the dealer yeah yeah see so they put a dolly on top of it right. So we were there to put a hundred dollars underneath that dolly after we already knew what the number was to get paid thirty five hundred, right? And we're all ready to do the move. And at the right time, when the when the mechanic, that's the person who switches the chips or puts in more chips, at the at the moment of truth, when the mecha- when our mechanic is getting re- is preparing to do the move, his hand shoots out, shoots out to where the chips are like this to try and switch them, right? And then another hand shot out from the other direction and the two hands collided like this and the chips went flying all over the place, yeah, right? In other words, the, the, the our mechanic's hand and another hand collided and the dolly went flying and the chips went flying. And it was, uh, it was an embarrassment, but we knew who they, we know what, we knew what they were doing and they knew what we were doing, which was basically the same thing. So uh, the guy, Joe, who was my mentor in all this, he had the immediate presence of mind to immediately spill a drink all over the layout to get everybody's attention off what happened and create chaos. And so nobody really even complained about it. The dealer never said anything about it. So we cleaned it up. But then we had a problem because we knew we had another team working. In, in, in Lake Tahoe while we were, and we, we were getting in each other's way, so we had to settle this somehow. So we left the table, they left the table, we started walking around looking for them, they started walking around looking for us, and we met up with them in another casino uh, in a bar. Uh, and it turned out that they were from Italy. And mo- most of the uh, professional pass posting uh, roulette teams are Italians. And the difference between them and us is in Italy, it's a generational thing, and most and most of the professional casino cheating teams in Italy are the mafia people. They're actually part of mafia uh, families. In yeah. Italy. So we and we, uh, we knew that. So you know we had to be careful with these guys. Uh, so um, to make the long story short, we made a truce with them. We there were four at the time on the south shore of Lake Tahoe. There were only four casinos: two on one side of the street, two on the other side of the street. And we made a truce with them. They said, okay, you guys stay here and you guys, and we stay here and we don't get in each other's way. And it was fine. And then, and then 
through the years, you know, for the next 10 or 15 years, every time we ran into them, we ran into them several times, like six or seven times. We would, we would sit down and talk and we would discuss, okay, you guys can have these casinos and we'll take these casinos. And, uh, and, you know, besides them, uh, uh, over the years, you know, I, I recognized other people's cheating, other professionals, but, you know, you know, I see, I see, you know, amateur cheats all the time. Plus now I also do undercover work for casinos looking for cheats. And I see these amateur cheats all the time that are just taking a shot for 20 bucks, 50 bucks or something like that. I see them all the time. And once in a while, I, I, I see a, a professional team that I know can do damage. Did you ever feel bad about it? <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, you know what, uh, Nick? A after a while, because I said in the beginning of, of, of the show, I said that I was a de degenerate gambler, which was really what led me to, to the cheat. And, and even in the first years of cheating, uh, I would go out and, and make twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars in a night cheating, and then I would go gamble it three hours after I finished cheating and lose it all, and then go back to do the cheating. It became like a like a cycle. So I was I was cheating, risking my ass cheating. This happened for six months, and whatever I made, I just went and gambled, and then because I always knew I could cheat, so so you know, uh, I finally learned to stop that, and I finally started to keep the money. So we made so once I started to. Uh, keep the money I accumulated a lot of money quickly and then after a couple of years to be honest it became more about the adrenaline it, it was so much fun you know uh, it was just so much fun it was like David against uh, Goliath right but it was it was just it was just uh, you know with all their equipment all their cameras all their surveillance all their security and we just went in there with wet balls and just you know pulled their pants down and stole all their money uh, you know, it was it was uh, it was just like the adrenaline rush you got off that. Uh, and, I, and people ask me that question all the time. You know, do you you know, uh, do you uh, regret what you're doing? Uh, do what you did? And, and I'm never I'm not going to bullshit people and say, oh, yeah, you know, now, I, you know, I, uh, I I found Jesus or somebody and I realized, uh, you know, I, I, I did something wrong. Hell no. I loved it. And the best part of my life was cheating <laughs> the casinos. That's all the questions I got. Is there anything you think that we missed, or how can people get a hold of you? I know you mentioned a book. Where, what's the name of it? Where can people find yeah, it? Uh, the, uh, the name of the book uh, is American Roulette. Uh, in the UK and Europe, it's called uh, the Great Casino Heist, and the easiest way to get it is right on Amazon or, or, or any other online bookseller. And it's uh, it's really an entertaining story and. Uh, my website is now called globaltablegamesprotection.com, globaltablegamesprotection.com. Uh, 